This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. You know what they say about my Patreon. Get it while it's hot. Hello to all the creeps and freaks of the internet looking for some MP4s to download into your Cortexes. I'm glad you stumbled upon this one. It's full of fun goofs and gags and all sorts of great stuff. Stuff that you can look at and go, oh man, that's great. I love it. Need some more of that. Get me a hot... Give me a piping hot spoonful of that to f send me home with a smile on my face and a, be a full belly. Much hath been blogged and vlogged and journalismed about the phenomenon of online radicalization. Whether it's through Facebook, YouTube, Gmail somehow, Club Penguin, if there's an online platform with content or people on it, right-wing radicalization seems to always be lurking around the corner, being a creep and a peeping tom, preying on young impressionable people that have an edgy sense of humor, or find themselves using certain gamer words. Last week I made a video looking specifically at radicalization on YouTube, with its history of pushing people towards viewing Nazi-style content. And after somewhat half-assingly concluding that it's not as bad as it used to be, I noticed a bunch of comments letting me know that actually it is still quite bad, but just in a different place. That place being the video sharing app TikTok. If you're unfamiliar, TikTok is a website where people log on and do w weird stuff for money, I think. I don't know. It has over a billion monthly active users and lots of different communities and content styles. I'm actually a big fan of some of the more abstract neuron fraying video genres on there like this. <laughs> But there is no shortage of awful content. Here on YouTube, making fun of that content has become its own industrial complex. Everybody's doing it. Literally everyone. But this video is going to look at the more serious implications of TikTok's bad content and where it can lead you. A recent case study done earlier this month unearthed some startling trends regarding TikTok's algorithm, transphobia, and their relationship to far-right radicalization. I found this study through a video by Shark300. It's a great video, shout out. It's linked in the description. So now I'm going to play the original TikTok from Abby Richards, who is one of the researchers, because she sums it up better than I could. And we'll touch base after that. We'll follow up. We'll circle back. We'll square we'll square down. We'll square dance. I'm a deeply annoying person. So we wanted to examine whether or not transphobia is a gateway prejudice that leads to like broader far right radicalization. It's been pretty clear for a while now that the far right is transphobic, but we wanted to see whether being transphobic alone was enough to lead you to the far right. So I made a brand new TikTok account and followed 14 creators known to post transphobic content. Then I started scrolling my For You page where I exclusively engaged with transphobic content and I documented the major narratives of the more than 400 videos recommended to me. Of the 360 total videos, 103 were homophobic or anti-trans, 42 were misogynistic, 29 contained racist narratives or white supremacist messaging, and 14 endorsed violence. Damn, son. <laughs> Where'd you find this? So those numbers are not good. Here's the graph showing the account's exposure to this content over the viewing period. You see right at the end of the journey, there's a little spike of calls to violence, anti-Semitism, and hate symbols, which we certainly do not like to see. We don't like it. Very bad. But you might be looking at this graph and saying, okay, well, what is, what is 25 racisms? What is that? Or, or 61 transphobias? What does that mean? In Abby's video, she doesn't show the content itself, which is understandable. TikTok might have flagged it if she had. But I think actually looking at this content, which they show in the article, is important to really drive home the point of just how widespread these hateful extremist ideas are and how dangerous this radicalization process has the potential to be. So I'm just going to go through some of the examples. Uh, trigger warning once again. There it is. Trigger warning, duh, bad stuff ahead. One example of content under the label transphobia or homophobia was a video showing a video game gunman shooting and killing characters at a gay pride celebration with the text, don't mind me just doing God's work. The video had over 200,000 views and the comment section was filled with people saying, hey, this is good. I like this. The most liked comment on the video was beautiful. Now do it in real life. Uh, hey, what? What's up? Hello? Hello. That video had 25,000 likes. Even if we were to assume that 99% of those likes were ironic, that's still 250 people that are essentially saying, hey, uh, violent hate crimes, uh, sexual orientation-based mass murder, 
sign me up. Another trend they noted was the way that this extreme content was able to be hidden from detection through the use of codes and symbolism, like this guy pretending to cry with text saying 50% of transgenders take their own lives. This fills me with so much sadness. But the music playing in the background was Bon Hovi's Living on a Prayer, the part where Mr. Hovi says we're halfway there. The implication being you know what the implication is, right? I don't have to explain that. Or this TikTok with the caption, I can't believe people used to get killed because they were gay. And the song in the back was stressed out by the 21st pilots. And the lyrics of that go, wish we could turn back time to the good old days. No, I'm not going to sing it, but yeah, 32,000 likes. Why? How? Parents, come get your kids. They're doing hate crimes. One trend played audio of a quote from Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, which led to the encouragement of harassment towards trans TikTok users. About 10% of the videos showed some form of support for these individuals, which is interesting that the same characters keep popping up on the pathway towards becoming a white supremacist. Probably just a coincidence. Don't worry about it. No need to look into it. It's all, everything's fine. We're fine. Three videos had Nazi dog whistles, like the 14 words, and they encountered some less coded racist rhetoric later on. Like this video, which showed screenshots of Google search results for three black teenagers versus three white teenagers. This post originates from 2016 when it was used as an example of the way algorithms reinforce racism, but that's not what this is. Um, here, the top comment says, well, that's not Google's fault. That comment had 70,000 likes, and the video had 5.2 million views. Million with an M. Not that the word million would ever start with anything other than an M, I'm just saying it's a big number. South Carolina. All of this content was found in just a few hours of scrolling, which, if you're familiar with TikTok, is not an uncommon amount of time for a TikTok scrolling session. The article is punctuated with the following quote, A user could feasibly download the app at breakfast and be fed overtly white supremacist and neo-Nazi content before lunch. If the Turner Diaries was adapted into a self-help morning routine guidebook, it still wouldn't be as good at making people racist as sitting on the toilet and using TikTok for the duration of a single poop. Damn, son. Unlike YouTube, where there are a few different factors as to which content you might end up seeing, like how the home page and recommendation tab display multiple choices for content, which you actually have to click on, TikTok is pure algorithm. The For You page begins playing something it thinks you'll like the moment you open the app. It doesn't give you a choice. It doesn't stop playing, and based on how it is designed to maximize time spent and engagement, once the algorithm gets a hint of what you like and starts showing you more of that, it can be extremely difficult to stop watching. That, coupled with the fact that this content is much shorter form, most of these videos were under a minute long, means the radicalization process from casual transphobia to overt extremism has the potential to happen at very fast short time, light style speeds. It's worth reiterating that this content is hardly fringe. It's not four followers, two likes, weird reply guy posting. As we went over, these videos all have a lot of traffic. One TikTok from the account White Pride Worldwide, hey that rhymes, that nice branding, had almost a million views and 93,000 likes, promoting overt white supremacy. And you'd think that there'd be some sort of barrier to entry for all these users that ended up at a video like this, but there's not. I have a TikTok account where I post these face morph thingies that are a little spooky, and for some reason it does well on there, so I thought it'd be a decent sample size of viewers to look at. No, this is not me plugging my TikTok. I'd actually prefer it if everyone unfollowed me on there and everyone unsubscribed to my YouTube and people just stopped perceiving me, but here we are. This TikTok with almost 2 million views received 97% of those views from the For You page, which is the algorithm pushing it out to people. That's basically how every post is. A platform being used multiple hours a day by a significant chunk of the human population is specifically designed to strip users of their agency. For 97% of its engagement, you don't have a say in what happens. And I just, I think that's great. There is a conversation to be had about the prevalence of the views and attitudes that lead people into this sort of content, but for now I think it's pretty safe to say the algorithm 
is clearly a problem. Earlier this year, TikTok was documented as being a primary organizational tool for the January 6th Capitol Confederate soldier LARPer diaper shitting party. And following this, in a statement to Politico, a TikTok spokesperson said, there is absolutely no place for violent extremism or hate speech on TikTok, and we work aggressively to remove any such content and ban individuals that violate our community guidelines. Well, it's been almost a year now, and I personally think you guys need to work aggressively er on fixing your shit because it's still bad. That's my money back guarantee moral of the story this video. Telling a quillion dollar company to do better. Do better. You are on the wrong side of history. This is activism, folks, in its purest form. One clear takeaway from this study is that the original research question of does transphobic content lead to far-right radicalization seems to have been answered pretty definitively. Yes, it does. What starts with mockery and derision very quickly escalates into hateful, violent rhetoric that extends towards other marginalized groups. All of these forms of hate are closely associated within the algorithm, an algorithm that essentially knows how people think. Billions of dollars in revenue generation hinge on its ability to know how people think. Which is why this metaphorical starting block of casual transphobia being so prominent in popular culture should be alarming to everyone. I'm talking about things like Dave Chappelle's recent Netflix special, The Closer, where he compares being trans to performing blackface and explicitly endorses turf ideology. Before you shatter all your keycaps and break through your desk and shit on yourself typing a comment asking me if I actually watched it, Yes, I did. Parts of it are very funny, in my opinion, because Dave Chappelle is an experienced comedian, and his story about his relationship with a uh, trans comedian Daphne Dorman is moving. But that doesn't mean the special isn't transphobic, or that it doesn't promote a form of uncritical contempt towards trans people. People that just want to live their lives without having their existence called into question by every dumbass that is thinking of going to that open mic night on Wednesday. His closing message is basically, I'm not going to stop telling transphobic jokes until you all stop being racist, which is an interesting way of saying black trans people don't exist. This just in, breaking news, that thing that exists? No, it doesn't. This review, which I will link in the description, is very good. You should read it if you're having trouble understanding why David's message is a problem, why framing black and queer struggles as being in competition with one another is what you do when you're sort of a silly boy. Also, these videos from Jesse Gender are really amazing. They're articulate, nuanced, all that good stuff, so watch those. They're, they're also linked. The Closer has been on the front page of Netflix since its release earlier this month. We have to assume it's been viewed millions of times, maybe billions or tr trillions, I don't know. And the people have decided that no, it's not transphobic actually. They they don't see a problem. And that, in itself, to me, is a problem. Because the casual transphobia of this special is not that different from the casual transphobia in the TikToks that have demonstrated their potential to radicalize people into far-right, violent, extremist spaces. And the popularity of this bigotry veiled in comedy is so widespread, so ingrained into our society, not only thanks to the presence of overt bigots online, but more importantly, the useful idiots who enable them, and the fact that these idiots are in positions of power in media, in journalism, and writing books about teenage wizards. They're all over the place. Very bad. Get them out. I'm the cancel culture king and I'm showing up at your place of business and pointing to you and saying you're fired. And then I'm calling your employer. With regards to fixing TikTok's problems, I think a great starting point is a study like the one we looked at, which paints a clear picture of this connection between transphobic TikToks and this almost instant radicalization effect. We definitely need more stuff like this to better understand the problem, and amplifying voices that are doing this work is important as well. But this then leads to the question, when or if TikTok decides that they're gonna do something about this, how far are they willing to go? How much money are they willing to spend on moderation? or sacrifice by turning the engagement dial from 17 trillion down to a slightly lesser number. Right now, we just don't know. And to be honest, I'm not getting my hopes up. If we were taking Facebook's situation into account, my hopes are swimming around in the molten core of the earth. The recent whistleblower documents basically show that the company could not give less of a hoot about the harm that is causing the world and actively fights against safeguards if it hurts their margins. And now they're rebranding to sort of sh shift focus from these facts. They made geriatric VR chat so you'd forget 
but I remember, and I don't see how TikTok would act any differently. YouTube's 2019 changes to combat extremism do seem to be having a positive effect. Even if Daily Wire garbage is still crammed into every square inch of free ad real estate on your screen, they're pretty quick to demonetize, take down, and ban content and channels that violate their guidelines. It's maybe a start that TikTok could try, but this won't happen without immense media pressure, just like with YouTube. So this, again, is me trying to do that. I'm applying pressure. What's up, YouTube? Today we're going to be doing some immense media pressure crimes. You probably already know this, but legislation on technology is a little bit behind the times. Will you commit to ending Finsta? Ending Finsta. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act states that internet companies are not legally responsible for the content they host if it was published by someone else. So on any of these platforms, if you put something crazy on there, that's on you. This mandate is from 1996, when the internet looked like this. So some legal updates on corporate responsibility are long overdue. I love that term, corporate responsibility. Always remember, when destroying the earth and decimating the human population, please do so responsibly. I just want to make one last point here. If the basis for this radicalization process is the normalization of transphobic comedy rhetoric, then starting there can't hurt either. So calling out casual transphobia whenever we see it is something that I feel like can be helpful, simply based on the fact that we see it all the time, like Chappelle's special or Turf Island journalism, or when the BBC posts a bullshit article with flawed statistics that paints trans people as rapists. I think you should dunk away, okay? Ratio these absolute gargoyles into oblivion. Make YouTube videos about it. Talk to your family about it, insofar as they aren't going to hurt you if you try to do that. Sorry to bring up trauma. Because in a few years time, when these people look back and say, oh yeah, we were the bigots the whole time, like the shittiest Scooby-Doo episode in history, you can have some fun receipts to print out and put up on your wall and point to and say, hey, that's, that's you. I remember that. You were talking some bullshit. You got my nine-year-old nephew into Steven Crowder TikToks and a week later he beat up a gay person. I think it's time for you to take feminist out of your Twitter bio. Okay, that's the video. That's it. Hope it was all right. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Your guys' feedback has been super helpful lately. Like the video if you liked the video. Special thanks to my patrons. You guys are the best. Patreon.com slash S-A-M-S-E-N. It's just my last name. How cool is that? I got my own last name as a URL. So shout out to whoever invented last names and URLs. Okay, bye. See ya.